Thanks, Helen. Um, there will be a couple of welcoming words. So there's repetition involved, I'm sorry for that. So I want to also welcome you to this exhibition, which is part of the, the Respublica project. Uh, it's actually quite a significant part. Uh, it's an important part. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to have Matthias and, and Christoph here uh, with the Open Community, Open Network exhibition, but also their talk, which is wonderful. Um, the title of the talk starts with three dots, so we should have three seconds of silence before I read the rest of the title, which is an archaeology of silence in the digital age. So that will be uh, where we start uh, the Respublica um, project. Now, I, before I give the floor to them, because it's basically about their voices, not so much mine, I want to explain a few things about the Respublica project as a whole and how well their work fits into that. Respublica has, it's, it's a, a melange, a mixture of two main ideas. One is a series of artistic expressions on democracy and on participation. That's one significant component. The other quite significant component is to work with participatory arts. And we try to integrate these two approaches, which are very different, combine them and integrate them into the Respublica Festival, organizing a reflection about what democracy is and democracy's complexities. There's actually a famous book by uh, David Held that has a wonderful title called Models of Democracy. And the plural in models is actually quite important. They're very, very different ways of organizing democracy and there are very different reflections about democracy. Now the work of Matthias and, and Christoph fits in this larger project perfectly, I would say, because it, it offers a almost unique crossroads of these two objectives. On the one hand, the discussions on the artistic discussions on democracy, but on the other hand also the interactive the participatory dimensions of opening up art itself, showing that it is also a process. And they're very much at the crossroads. And that makes it, I think, quite significant for me, and I'm very happy to have you here because of these reasons. But there are a couple of things I want to add, and that only increases my pleasure uh, of having you here as part of the Respublica Festival. And one is that I, I come from a media studies background, right? I'm a media communication scholar. What we always explain people is that we shouldn't overemphasize the importance of technology when talking about social change. We go into this mantra, we should not see technology as the starting point of everything. But what your work shows is how important it can be if it becomes integrated into social processes, if it becomes part of the social. If it's not seen as something isolated, as something that is the ultimate solution of everything, that if you buy a computer for everything, for everybody, then we will have world peace, poverty will disappear, that kind of arguments. What you're showing is that it actually can be done in ways that work. I think that's one of the reasons, one of the strengths, I think, of your work. The second, and I only have two, so rest assured, I will shut up in about five seconds. The, only, the second argument I have and the second point I want to raise is even more important. Because if you work with social change, if you work with technology and social change, what you still often have is the idea that we will simply put the technology there, give people the technology that we think they need, quite often without asking them. And that happens in a lot of social change projects. What you do is that you embed these interventions in the social needs of particular communities. And that is incredibly significant. And I cannot emphasize enough how unique that is. In a lot of cases, the interventions come from the outer space and they're being dumped onto people without asking what their needs are, what they want. And you work with communities establishing what their needs are, not what your needs are, but what their needs are, allowing them to use these technologies for their own benefit and not for the benefit of some donor uh, or some other people that have nothing to do with them. And I think that makes it extremely important and that makes it a very nice fit with the, um, the Respublica project. Having said that, I need to thank Helene, I need to thank Yanis uh, for all the work, but also Orestes, standing there, and Hazal for helping us capture at the moment. And having said that, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you.
So thanks, Nico, for the introduction. We would like to thank Neem for inviting us, and especially Helen Black and uh, Yanis Kolakidis, and further also Kristalini uh, Lois Sidu and all the participants in the meetings, discussions, and workshops that we had here in Cyprus. Which forces affect our subjective views? How far are we authors of our own views? The internet serves as a study object and research medium as well. One's own subjective view on the internet serves as an invitation to explore the borders of one's own perception. Many nations have an active internet censorship. Here is a collection of forms of blockings of communication. Examples from Iran, Thailand, Switzerland, the Emirates, Germany, Cyprus. It's the pokerstars.com which is uh, redirected to nba.gov.si. The World Wide Web, the platform for global data exchange, is quite a diverse heterogeneous formation. The infinite freedom of a virtual space is unveiled as an illusion. We took this picture 10 years ago, sitting on the great, great Chinese wall. When people travel so far, they usually take pictures like this. But back then, we had eyes for something different. It was not sightseeing, but it was about seeing what is not to see. We spent most of our time in the crowded and extensively monitored internet cafes. The firewall, the so-called great um, Chinese firewall, inhibits the invocation of censored websites within China due to words in the content, the URL, or because of the permanent blocking of the whole website. But how can we see what we cannot see? How to discover the blind spots? In the last years, we de developed community and open source projects on the digital communication. Within these projects, we got in contact with people and activists from around the world. On the picture here is Basia Kamlamo, a Tibetan activist. Surprisingly, we got even contributions from North Korea. An open communication structure allows a communicative exchange and opens new perspectives. Um, an archaeology of silence um, is a quote of uh, Michel Foucault, and he wrote about the problems that um, on, on the grounds of, uh, on the philosophical grounds um, of a an, an certain order of rationality, there is something that has to be pushed aside or brought to silence. And exactly between these two things, they were heavily discussed because it, he brought it into the discourse, what might be a contradiction to discuss about the silence. But, um, or silencing parts of the discussion. So um, here it is very interesting when we go into the digital um, age and in the digital field, then here we see real the blackouts, but we can follow them and we can materialize them. And so this is the interesting point in our work. So it's not so much about other people, it's very much about our own sight, our own idea of the world, our own perception, and how these borders are done. So one of the uh, most uh, common um, breakdowns of internet and di digital communication is when a natural disaster happens. So that leads to blackouts. And here's a quote from Tokyo about the media in Japan after the earthquake and the following, uh, and the tsunami, and that led then to Fukushima nuclear power meltdown in March 2011. And here is a journalist writing about that the infrastructure completely collapsed and therefore they, doubt, they didn't know what happened, and people around the world not close to this uh, real spot knew what happened. So they were informed due to digital media what collapsed in this region. This is a very interesting thing that we see other things. We are in another context in the digital age. So the Green Movement in Iran 2009 is a very good example for that. 
This was um, considered as the first Twitter revolution, and tens of thousands of Twitter users turned their profile pictures green in solidarity with the activists. For users of social media, the protests in Iran were an inescapable global story. But an investigation by Al Jazeera some years later confirmed that only 60 active Twitter accounts were in Tehran. Iranian bloggers blocked bloggers who took part in the protests. Um, so they, they tweeted in English and the language on the ground was Farsi. So it's, it, it was not related what happened on, tweet, uh, on Twitter and in these tweets and what was considered worldwide as the Iranian revolution. So we are always part in a specific setting and with our communication possibilities we are locked in this. So the trust in the narratives of revolutions throughout this communication possibilities are traps. The idea of a Twitter or Facebook revolution has been on the ground mostly the contrary, a shutdown of the internet. And this was our next topic to dive into. We had a large community fighting against censorship, but how to handle internet and mobile service during shutdowns, shutdowns like the one in Ethiopia last year, how to overcome such forms of division and separation. This is an example from the old days of spying networks with Echelon. Echelon Cyprus is part of the listening posts of geostationary satellites. Due to this media report, it's a German one, the US Secret Service NSA runs a program to spy in the cable communications from the deep sea cable under the code name Sounder. And now predominantly the internet traffic from Syria, Lebanon, Israel and Palestine are intercepted in Cyprus. You see there is a missing link between the cables and the spy posts. And uh, this missing link or the interconnection is CITA, the Cyprus Telecommunications Authority, um, which has a contract um, with uh, GCHQ to um, allow them to monitor all the traffic in Cyprus. So this might be an interesting link between these two forces, these global forces, the one, the digital communication with the huge data cables, uh, around the world, and the other one uh, is this specific points where um, assumingly are the spy posts of um, the British and the Americans. And so the, the interesting thing is that we have here Saita Global. So Saita from this small island, from this little nation, um, Cyprus, is a global player in the field of digital communication and that's very very interesting so digital communication and especially the deep sea cables became so important that to spy into these cables bring the whole picture of uh, um, what's going on in the world and so Cyprus is part of the huge networks they go from Malta and um, up to um, um, Turkey and Greece and to um, Israel here, for example, or in this one, and a an, an huge cable from um, Egypt to France, or this one around whole Europe up to um, Germany and the UK, around Spain and through the Middle East. Um, through the Mediterranean, and here is Cyprus, and then through Far East to Korea. So the interesting thing is that Cyprus became part of this, and a very important part, but not all Cyprus. So there is another cable, or two, two cables are here, and they go to Turkey. And so the interesting question was how this all is related together. 
And to reflect on this whole situation became so, so important because this is the link between geopolitics and the personal individual view and the own perception of the world or the own access to uh, a broader communication. And in this specific um, and individual situation, we can be locked out or isolated, and this is crucial, and it is crucial to overcome this. So, um, Cristalini, Marios, and others wrote together this paper about the censorship, the internet censorship in Cyprus. And um, here another picture how it looks like. So these are 3,413 entries, so these are web addresses, they are blocked in Cyprus. So uh, one particular address interested us very much, so, and this is that one. It's mybet.com. So all these addresses are about um, gambling, so online gambling, and they are considered as illegal because they have not the uh, proper um, allowance. Uh, from Cyprus specifically. But here is an address, and this is mybet.com.cyprus. So how can it be that an address in Cyprus is sold in Cyprus and then blocked in Cyprus? So this is especially interesting because the addresses are, especially the, the national addresses, those with two letters, the so-called country top-level domains, are the addresses for the specific nation. So this was the, the um, agreement with the um, uh, Americans who started the internet with the .com, .gov, .all the three letters, edu.org, and so on these um, endings of internet addresses. And then they gave to the count, to the special nations, their two-letter endings. So how can Cyprus be owner of addresses and afterwards going to block it. So that's a um, contradiction in the implementation of a law, a specific law. So uh, the university is the seller of the addresses, so the University of Cyprus, and they are um, the responsible for um, handling these addresses. So, but on the other hand, the blockers, they are also the government-run uh, um, CITA. Looking exactly into these um, 3,413 domains, so there were 32 not found. That means it's uh, wrong blocking, but uh, that's not so much. I must say, because it's on a DNS level and the, the censorship, and so this is quite good internationally, so it's a, a, a little um, mistake. So, But 3,380s were then censored of these domains, 2,560s were .com addresses, 80 net, 25 org, but then it comes 182.eu, that's under the European distinction, law distinction, and then um, specific nations in the European Union. And so it's very interesting to see that this is European law, so you can apply this European law to European addresses. So that's uh, one of the contradictions here. And this might be further um, investigated. The very interesting thing was that we um, experienced here in, in short tests quickly. So it's a rough test, it's first test, it's first attempt, but we experienced that it goes really from the green zone to the south or to the north. So uh, this is a, also a an, an line where the internet access is really um, different. So we have tried to um, uh, check the internet censorship here um, on the island in several parts to get access to many um, of the providers. We used internet cafes also here. Um, we had access to three different providers in the north um, where we can kind of say that we did not found censorship on two of them, uh, on Turk Telecom and Nethouse, two big providers, and uh, we found some censorship on a, um, a very small provider um, 
Adon Communications Limited in Nicosia. Um, on the other hand, uh, we found here in the south, um, in uh, Saita, um, uh, Fixnet and Saita Mobile, um, the whole list implemented. We, we checked it through, we saw it before, and um, we saw another provider um, with absolutely no findings. Apparently, they have not implemented the internet censorship. Back to another project we did um, in 2014, was it? Um, we have been invited to uh, Turkey, to um, different Turkish um, institutions and hackerspaces, and um, it was exactly in the time when um, the uh, local governments were elected. It was in the run-up of the municipal election in, in 2014, and we see here two um, censored websites in Turkey at that time. So one is Twitter, they blocked Twitter in, in the run-up, and the other one um, was YouTube, they blocked YouTube uh, due to some uh, leaks that um, alleged uh, uh, kind of, I think, the son of Erdogan of, of corruption. And um, what was uh, interesting uh, in this time was also that the whole censorship system was changing from a, a simple DNS censorship, which was relatively easy to circumvent, like here in Cyprus, you can use one of the um, other uh, DNS servers and then you're out of the censorship and nothing is blocking you, to a total hijack of uh, the DNS protocol as a whole. So uh, you could imp uh, in your system, uh, say, okay, please use an other um, name server that has all, that makes all the correct resolutions, but at the same time, you were thinking that you would always get uh, the correct answers, but um, the uh, service provider or the government gave you always the, the wrong ones or just the censored ones. Um, we were there uh, to kickstart a mass uh, communication network, a Wi-Fi network. Uh, you may see here in the space also some of uh, the antennas and um, the uh, big um, dream was of course the connection uh, over the Bosporus. But was, what are these antennas? Um, we started in 2011 with the idea that when you are blocked um, and when we are always trapped in these um, uh, systems, uh, in these boundaries of, um, of the infrastructure, we could try to become our own infrastructure and uh, create a collaborative uh, infrastructure. And one of the possibilities to do that is uh, to create um, a, a Wi-Fi interconnection. When we look at the um, infrastructure that we have today, it's usually kind of a start topic. So it uh, goes out from the backbone and the service provider, and then at the end um, uh, is, is the user. Um, the same with the uh, telephony providers. And what we try to do is a, is a Wi-Fi mesh network, which means a direct interconnection of all our devices that become at the same time the infrastructure. So we can not only directly communicate to our neighbors, um, but we can also transfer um, the, re the, the data traffic from another um, user that is nearby over our uh, device to the next device. And so every device in this network actually enlarges the network. We called the project CallNet and um, implemented also the possibility that you could download the software directly from every node. Because when there is no internet uh, anymore, um, then it's really difficult to go in the internet to download a program to afterwards set up um, your communication infrastructure. So this is one another picture from uh, the workshops we made in um, Istanbul. And about, about the, the relation of the democracy and um, digital communication, that's really a very interesting point. And um, so uh, the, the 
most um, significant project um, of ours is, is most probably uh, here the one we did in Berlin. So uh, because there it was, it was um, really the situation what was for, our, for us the, the everyday situation. What it is here with the internet censorship of CITA, what is for other people on the flight and, 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 con and constant um, hide and um, search process and um, a constant threat that when they use uh, digital communication they can be threatened by it. So, but um, here we come to a an, an, uh, situation in Berlin and this is interesting also from an artistic point of view then our, uh, our opportunities to exercise participation and to express oneself is always bound to a certain order. If we become aware of the constellation, the terms and the condition of communication, it not only broadens our horizon, it allows us to look behind the regulations that limit our world view. In 2014, we have been invited to the Swiss Embassy in Berlin um, to show our artwork and projects there. And this invitation really thrilled us because the Embassy the Swiss Embassy in Berlin is special, as it sits right next to the Federal Chancellery. No one is closer to Chancellor Merkel than the Swiss diplomats. <laughs> the government district in Berlin also contains the Reichstag, which is Germany's parliament, and the Brandenburg Gate. And right next to the gate, there are other embassies, in particular the US and the British Embassy. Over the last years, we learned that from the roof of the American and the British embassies, the secret services have been listening to the entire district, including the mobile phone of Angela Merkel. The antennas of the British GCHQ were hidden in a white cylindrical radon, while the listening post of the Amer American NSA is covered by radio transparent screens. But how to address these hidden and disguised forces? We accepted the invitation of the Swiss Embassy and use this opportunity to exploit the specific situation. Because if people are spying on us, it stands to reason that they have to listen to what we are saying. On the roof of the Swiss Embassy, we installed a series of antennas. They weren't uh, as sophisticated as the ones used by the Americans and the British, most probably. Um, they were makeshift can antennas, not camouflaged, and totally obvious and visible. And then the Academy of Arts joined the project, and so we built another large antenna on their rooftop, exactly between the listening post, post of the NSA and the GCHQ. Never have we been observed in such detail while building an art installation. A helicopter circled over our head with a camera a pivoting one that could really uh, turn to every angle and uh, looking to every move we made and on the roof of the US Embassy security officers patrolled. Although the government district is governed by a strict police order, there are no specific laws relating to digital communication. Our installation was therefore perfectly legal and the Swiss ambassador informed Chancellor Merkel about it. We called the project, Can You Hear Me? The antennas created an open and free Wi-Fi communication network in which anyone who wanted to would be able to communicate and participate using any Wi-Fi enabled device and send messages to those listening on the frequencies that were being intercepted. Text messages, voice chat, file sharing, anything could be sent anonymously. And people did communicate. Over 15,000 messages were sent. And here are some examples. Hello world. Hello Berlin. Hello NSA. Hello GCHQ. This is the NSA's Achilles heel, open networks. NSA agents do the right thing blow the whistle. This is the NSA. In God we trust, all others we track. Agents, what was the story of yourself? Will you tell your grandchildren? 
I'm not going to read this, but it means uh, do not spy on me, um, and it's the binary representation of ASCII code. Make love, not cyber war. At NSA, my neighbors are noisy. Please send a drone strike. <laughs> Anonymous is watching. NSA, GCHQ, we are part of your organizations. Expect us. We will shut down. Can you hear me? Created a platform to discuss the potential and the limits of communication. We invited the embassies and government departments to participate in this open network too. And to our surprise, they did. Files appeared on the network, including classified documents leaked from a parliamentary investigation commission, which highlights that the free exchange and discussion of vital information is starting to become difficult even for members of a parliament. We should not take it for granted to be boundlessly connected. We should start making our own connections, fighting for this idea of an equal and globally interconnectable world. This is essential to overcome our speechlessness and the separation provoked by rival political forces. Thank you. <laughs>